Hello, everyone. This is Carlos Lara from the Research Center in Mathematics at Zacatecas, Mexico. Uh, the Research Center in Mathematics is opening a new master's degree program in robotics. To celebrate this event, we organized a series of talks on robotics and human computer interaction. Our invited speaker today is the Professor Stephen Brewster. Thanks for accepting our invitation, Professor Brewster. And let me introduce him. Currently, he is professor uh, of human computer interaction in the School of Computing Science at the University of Glasgow. His main research interest is in multimodal human computer interaction, sound, haptics, and gestures. He has done a lot of the research in ear tones, and a particular form of non speech sounds. Professor Brewster got a degree in computer science at the University. University of Hereford, Shire, in the United Kingdom. After a period of in industry, he did his PhD in Com Human Computer Interaction Group at the University of York in the UK. Uh, the title of his th thesis was uh, Providing a Structured Method for Integrating Non Speech Audio into Human Computer Interfaces. That is where he developed the interest in ear tones and non-speech sound. After finishing his PhD, he worked as research fellow for the European Union as part of the European Research Consortium for Informatics and Mathematics. He is member of the his research section, and within that, he leads the multimodal interaction group doing world leading research in human computer interaction. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and um, a member of the ACN CIC Academy and an ACM Distinguished Speaker. Please welcome Professor Brewster. Thank you. Uh, right, let me share my slides. Can you see my slides okay? Yes, perfectly. Good. Um, thank you, Carlos, for the invitation. Very happy to, uh, to meet you all. Uh, the last time I saw Carlos was in, in Colombia when we were both uh, visiting there. Uh, and I was I was trying to learn how to uh, to do dancing uh, and trying to copy Carlos, who was much better at it than I was. Uh, anyway, let's move on to the to the uh, topic of the day, which is uh, all about ultrasound. So we have a project going on, looking at how we can use ultrasound for human computer interaction. Um, and ultrasound could do some interesting things, which uh, other te other technologies can't. So I'm going to try and talk about some of those and see if uh, so I'll show you some videos, see if I can convince you that ultrasound is a, an interaction technique of the future. So where am I from? So I'm right over there on the right hand side. I hope I've got uh, the university kind of your university in the right place there. So kind of a long way away. It's a shame that I can't come to visit you face to face, maybe after the, the COVID crisis is over. Uh, this is what the university looks like. Uh, so some people, some people think if you're if you're a fan of uh, Harry Potter, that it looks like Hogwarts, the school where Harry Potter uh, goes to school. Uh, so we have a we have a kind of nice old building. Unfortunately, my office isn't in the nice old part, uh, but there we are. It looks nice on the in the photographs. So I'm part of the Glasgow Interac Interactive Systems section, which is in the computer science department at the university. Um, so we are interested in all sorts of different aspects of, uh, of human computer interaction or HCI. Um, as Carlos mentioned, my main interest is in multimodal human computer interaction. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. We have others in our group who work on social robotics, social signal processing. Um, we have people who work on ethics and trust in data. Uh, we have usable security. We have a new a new faculty member who works on animal computer interaction. So we're we're pretty broad in the, in the range of things that we do. You can see our webpage there. Uh, so 
for those of you coming from different backgrounds, what, what is human computer interaction? Well, the, the ACM, which is the kind of professional organization of computing, they define it as uh, a discipline concerned with the design, evaluation, and implementation of interactive computing systems for human use and with the study of major phenomena surrounding them. So it's really all about humans using technology, trying to make the technology easier to use, make it accessible to more different types of users, doing different types of things in different situations. So the particular part that I'm most interested in is this idea of the multimodal interaction. This is um, how we can let the users use all the capabilities that they have to interact with the technology. If you think about it now, most of the time I'm just using my eyes to look at the screen and I'm using my fingers to type on a keyboard or touch screen. I'm not really using all the things that I've got as a human. So I've got a rich sense of touch, I've got a sense of smell, I've got a good sense of hearing, taste, and I've got all these different capabilities. And I can do input by speech, I can do input by gestures, all sorts of things. But quite a lot of the time, our technology doesn't take advantage of those. So the aim of multimodal interaction is to really see how we could use those. So it's to investigate human capabilities, you know, what is it that humans can do? And then design interaction techniques and applications that can take advantage of these. So for example, it might be that uh, if you have a visual impairment, you, know, you can't use the screen, you need another way to, to, to get your information. So perhaps you could use, you could use sound. Um, or if you have a motor impairment, maybe using a keyboard is difficult. How can you do input in a different situation? Uh, so we, we're kind of thinking about all range of different types of users, all types of applications. So one of the areas that we've mostly been focusing on, I'll talk more about today, is this area of haptics. So that's anything to do with your sense of touch. So how can you use touch for input? It might be gestures, it might be force by, by applying force, uh, it might be the vibration that you get from your mobile phone when you receive a message, all sorts of different things. The you know, sense of touch is, is very rich, but really our devices don't take advantage of that. So mostly what I'm going to talk about today is, is how we can use ultrasound, but there are all sorts of other aspects of, of haptics that uh, we and lots of other people are also uh, researching. The other things we do, well, we look at this in, in terms of VR and AR quite a lot. So how do we use, how do we do good interaction in virtual reality or augmented reality? So we're very interested in, in um, multimodal interaction in augmented and virtual reality. Lots of work on touch screens and now touch screens of course are, are moving from phones to everywhere so we move a lot of our work over to in-car user interfaces Many new cars now have touch screens and how how can you operate those in the car is it safer than using the physical controls they used to be in the old days we do things with interaction with tv we look with accessibility as i mentioned before a lot of work on multimodal interaction is uh, is to help people with impairments visual impairments or physical impairments and we also have a strand of work on, uh, on mental health as well, looking at how we might use technology to support mental health. So we have projects on dementia and brain injury and things like that. But what we're going to talk about today, ultrasound interaction. So this might not be something that you've really thought very much about before. But as I said at the beginning, ultrasound has got some, some interesting capabilities uh, for humans. So if you think back to your... Uh, school physics. If you combine two sound waves, it's in the bottom of the of the slide there, you get these interference patterns. So sometimes the wave fronts come together and they, they create a stronger force and sometimes they interfere and create a weaker force. So you get uh, this area of high pressure. So you can see, for example, in the middle between source one and source two, there you get a, you get a, a high pressure region. So what that means is that we can create feelable forces in the air. So I could put my hand in the air and then I can have a force beamed to it so I can feel something in midair. That's quite interesting because it's a non-contact form of haptics. Normally, if you think about haptics, you, know, you have to be in touch with your phone in order to get the vibration feedback. If you're not touching it, you can't feel it. You might be able to hear the phone vibrating on the table, but you can't touch it. You've got to touch it. So the interesting thing about ultrasound is you can put your hand in, in, uh, in space and then we can beam ultrasound 
forces to it wherever we want to. So it's a, a non-contact form of haptics. Um, how do we do it? Well, the hardware isn't very, uh, isn't very complicated. So actually the hardware that we use is um, the same as would be in uh, a car, which would stop you reversing into a wall. So these are, the, these are the, the ultrasound transducers that would be in the bumper of a car, uh, which would then fire out ultrasound, is picked up by a detector, uh, and then can tell you whether you're about to bump into something when you're reversing. So the, the loudspeakers themselves, they're just fancy loudspeakers, nothing, nothing particularly unusual. It's what you, what, the way we combine them that's most interesting. By combining the timings and the amplitudes very carefully across this big array, then we can create strong forces. Now, in a presentation, it's a bit hard to show the forces because it's invisible. So here's a little video. Um, uh, you can see the array of loudspeakers at the bottom. Uh, and you can see these pieces of paper moving uh, as we control a force uh, generated above that array in different, uh, in different places across the array. So it's a little bit hard to show it because uh, it's invisible, uh, but you can see it through these pieces of paper moving. Here's another way to show it. Um, so this is. Uh, uh, called Schlieren imaging. So uh, this is a, a way of seeing a sound field. So you can see the sound waves moving from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Uh, you can see now we put this, this um, uh, obstacle in the, in the sound field. You can see the sound waves bouncing off it. So where that hits the, the obstacle, the forces would be felt. So you can put your hand into there and then you can you can feel that force against your hand so you're not touching anything the sound is just being beamed towards your hand and then you can feel that as a, as a force now ultrasound of course it's a very high frequency those, those loudspeakers we use are uh, about 40 to 44 kilohertz and your skin you can't feel anything of that high frequency on your skin what we do is we modulate that down to about 250 hertz, um, so 250 uh, wave fronts against your hand per second, um, and that is uh, a frequency that you can feel. That's not far off the kind of frequency you might get from your mobile phone's uh, vibration motor. Uh, so that, through that, then we can produce texture, we can produce roughness, we can position the, the feedback at different points on your hand. Um, and the traditional way of doing that is via amplitude modulation. So you just control the amplitude, turning it on and turning it off again. Uh, and that works well, but uh, reduces the overall amount of force because sometimes the uh, loudspeakers are turned off. And the force is not that strong because you're just moving air. So you want to have as much force as possible. So we developed a new, te a new technique called spatiotemporal modulation. In this case, we can run the, the um, sound at maximum amplitude all the time. But we then, we then move it around quickly, to, around a focal point. Um, and that creates, still creates the feeling of a single point of contact against your hand, but gives you much larger force. And also then we can move it more quickly around your whole hand and create a larger area of haptic force if we want to. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to represent a circle on the hand, we could do that, draw that circle 100 times per second, you get the feeling of a solid circle on your hand. Um, but with a, uh, a higher intensity or a higher force. Um, and this, this rendering has a big, big impact on perception. Um, because you're just pushing air against a person's hand, then um, if you're not careful, it, it doesn't feel very strong. But if you, do it, if you do it right, you can create a strong feeling. So some of the earliest work in, in this field was looking at, again, this was using amplitude modulation, so, so the, the simple technique was looking at how you can perceive force on the hand, where you can perceive it, how far the, the points would have to be apart before you can detect them, looking at motion and things like that. Um, and as it, as it turns out, yes, humans are very sensitive, so we can create um, um, uh, zones of haptic force with about 8.5 millimeters gap between them to be detectable. Uh, actually, uh, the, the y-axis is a bit worse than the x-axis, um, and it's better near the center of the hand, near the center of the palm, than the edges. Part of that is just because the way the mechanoreceptors are laid out in your skin, the sensors that are inside your skin. That's nothing really to do with the, with the ultrasound. 
Um, and we can control motion very well. So we can, by moving a, a point around on your hand, we can create a feeling of motion, or if we move it fast enough, then we can create a solid feeling. And so with this hardware, we can, we got good control over the, over the position of these focal points of sound um, uh, and where we put them and how we move them. So what can we do with them once we can, once we can control them? So one of the applications we were looking at was this idea of virtual controls. So maybe you can, you can create some controls in midair uh, when you need them. Here's, a, here's an example one maybe. So maybe this um, device is by the side of your PC and you want to have a, a slider. You can pop up the slider in space next to your computer. You can feel it with your sense of touch. You can slide the slider. And when you don't need it anymore, the slider disappears. So you can create these controls when you need them. Uh, we also looked at this in card dashboards. So instead of having to reach out to touch a control, um, you can put your hand out, and then we can draw the control underneath your hand so that you, can, uh, you don't have to reach across and try and find the controls and get distracted from the road. Uh, you can feel them. Uh, and we've also looked at um, using them with phones. I'll give you, a, give you some examples of that in a minute, but that you can create um, controls above your phone. So it may be that then you can interact above your phone and then feel the controls above your device. So your phone is always going to have a small screen, but you can then create a larger interaction space by projecting the haptics above the phone. Uh, so yeah, you can create different types of controls. You can create, you can create, uh, create um, sliders, dials, buttons, all sorts of different things. So one of the Particular examples that we worked on was, was looking at how you might ultrasound use ultrasound haptics for above and around a phone. Now, for a little while, phones have used the cameras on the front to be able to detect your fingers to enable interaction. But the trouble with that is for these mid-air gestures, there's no feedback. There's nothing to touch. And that often leads to poor interaction and poor usability because there's nothing to touch. You can maybe see something on the screen, but maybe your hand is obscuring the screen so you can't see it anymore. So the nice thing you could do with the ultrasound haptics is project the haptics onto your hand so you can feel it, but still interact above the phone. So you can do gestures, but you get the haptic feedback. And that's been shown in the past to give you um, much better interaction, high quality interaction. Um, that brings up some interesting problems though, um, particularly is that you might have sound fields with got holes in them. So if you think about how you might use um, some kind of ultrasound device with your phone. You could have it in different types of orientations. So maybe the one on the left, you know, you have your phone and then the ultrasound loudspeakers are around the edge. But that means there's no speakers in the middle, and therefore there's a gap. Or maybe you have them coming out the sides or the bottom or the top. Um, so there may be a gap in the ultrasound speakers, which creates um, uh, holes in the sound field. So uh, on this particular project that we, we, did, we did with Huawei, we were looking at how you might be able to use uh, arrays of speakers with holes in them. So here's one example. Um, uh, this one doesn't have a hole in it. This is just basically the idea of a, a, an accessory that, that might slide out from the back of your phone and then give you an array of transducers at the side. But the nice thing about this one is um, what it does when you're above the phone. So what you can see then on the top left, is your phone and your array of speakers. And then the, the um, graphs, the heat maps, show you the, the amount of force at various different heights above um, the, the array. Um, so uh, very close to the surface of the array in the first one, you can see there's a slight purple on the left and then it's black on the right. Your hand is very close to the array. Uh, and if it's too close, then the sound beams where we're beaming at your hand can't really form, so you don't get much force. But as you see, you move your hand up a bit higher, um, then uh, you start to get um, a stronger feeling of force. And actually, if you get to say about 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, the sound then starts to spread over the, over the surface of the foam. So not only do you get sound, sound haptic field over the array, you also get sound over the over the phone as well. So that means that I can do, I can do interactions over my phone and still get haptic feedback. And of course, as you get higher, away, higher up, further away from the array, um, the forces get a bit weaker. But when you're 
when you're in um, you know, 10 to 15, 20 centimeters above the phone, you get quite strong force and then you can interact over the phone or the array. So it gives you a nice, nice interaction space. So it does show that you can create um, useful sound fields from arrays with holes in them, uh, which you could then use as accessories on phones. So yeah, we, we can create forces in the air but non-contact haptic. So the really interesting thing is here, you don't have to be physically touching anything. We can beam that to you. It's very well perceived by users. People like it, but the forces are not that strong unless you take care about the rendering. Um, and yeah, we can, we can create interesting transducer layouts. Interesting, maybe it's got holes in it, it's asymmetrical. Um, and with some clever, clever uh, modeling of the sound, of the shape of the array, you can still create good quality haptic feedback. We've still been thinking about how you may also do stronger forces because the forces are, you know, it's only air that's being moved, so it's not super strong. Um, we just had a paper published um, last month looking at how you might do pseudo haptics, which is using some, some kind of visual tricks to kind of uh, help the haptics feel stronger. We've also used some audio alongside the haptics. Again, that can, that can make it feel rougher or smoother. So you can manipulate people's perception by using this multimodal feedback, by using uh, feedback in multiple senses at the same time. So it's a nice example also there of, of multimodal interaction. So that's the first, the first part. We can use uh, ultrasound for uh, generating haptic feedback, but we can also do other things with it, which are potentially um, uh, more interesting. So levitation. So, uh, this is a project which we're running right now. And this has this kind of uh, grand aim of creating a, a radical new human computer interaction paradigm that empowers the unadorned user to reach into a new kind of display composed of levitating matter. So that, that sounds kind of uh, very grand and amazing. Uh, but what we're trying to do in this case is uh, get away from the virtual pixels that we're all using on the screens in front of us and create physical pixels made out of physical things that we can then use as displays. So this uses the same hardware as, as I used before. If you think about the, the forces that I was beaming to your hand, well, we can also use those forces to hold objects in the air. So we use phased array ultrasound. So that's, that's uh, controlling the timing very precisely across the, uh, the loudspeakers in that array. Uh, so we can do that, we can support objects in the air. Now these are small objects, what we're talking about as um, small styrofoam beads, um, about maybe two millimeters, two millimeters up to four millimeters uh, in size. So these, these act like physical pixels, so not the pixels on your screen, but these are physical pixels that we can control. So the idea is that then, because these are very small, we can then compose them into uh, complex displays and build um, physical models. We can build 3D models. Uh, so by creating a, a, a set of you know, 100 of these pixels in space, we can create a model or something. So people often say, you know, is this, is this the kind of levitation which could levitate a, you know, a person or, a, or some kind of object? That's not the aim here. There's other ones you can use for that. You know, electromagnetic levitation has been around a long time. Think about electromagnetic levitation is good for very large things, but it's not good for very small and very precisely controlled things. The thing about ultrasound is it's very precise, so we can do very precisely controlled things. I'll give you some examples of, of types of things we can do. Here's, a, here's an example to show you that we're, that, that we're not cheating. So here's, here's a simple array. You can see that this time there's two arrays of those loudspeakers, top and bottom, and the white, those white dots are the small polystyrene beads. So they're held up inside the soundscape, in this case, using standing waves between those two um, arrays of speakers. And you can see that we can move them around. So this is an early prototype that kind of gives you the idea. Uh, and you, know, you can see there, there's no string holding them up. We're not cheating. There's no magic. Uh, we're, we're holding those beads in place. So that was one of our early prototypes. Um, here's a more, here's a more uh, recent one where we've been looking at more kind of complex motions. So here you can see 
and we've got four beads uh, being levitated. This is a much larger levitation device, but again, you can see the array at the bottom. There's also another array at the top. Um, so here we can control the corners of these, uh, these four beads to make the corners of a cube and then, and then control their, uh, their motion, uh, in this case, uh, and rotation. Um, oops, next slide. Here's another rotation, this time in a different dimension. So this is actually much harder to do than the other dimension, because here you're, you're rotating uh, in and out of these standing waves. So getting the beads to line up and then move out of, of the standing wave is, is difficult. You can see them is shaking around a little bit more because it's more unstable. A lot of the work here really comes down to clever acoustics. And we work as part of this project, we work with some great acousticians in Sweden who help us um, with designing these sound fields. And we, were, we, were, we were very happy when we managed to get it to rotate in and out of the vertical because moving in and out of the same uh, standing wave is very difficult. But what these things show is that we, we've got good control of these individual pixels. We can move them around and control what we do with them in space. Um, now, of course, we're not just interested in this as a display. We're also interested in it as a form of interaction. So here's, here's you and one of the guys working with me on the project. Um, so looking at how we might do interaction. So you can see uh, in front there, if you can see that there's a leap motion controller detecting his hands. Um, and then uh, you can see he's, he's able to do different kind of interactions. So we can map that, map the controls, the motions from the, uh, from the gesture sensor to the beads in the array. So we can actually interact with them. The other interesting thing you can do is uh, integrate other objects into the, in, into the display. Um, so here, we've got some objects made of uh, this felt material and this wire mesh. Um, so the interesting thing about these materials is that um, they're acoustically transparent. So the sound passes through them. So they have no effect on the, uh, on the sound field. So you can see here, we're kind of simulating the game where you have to I'll play it again, where you have to run the, the uh, metal hoop along the wire. And if you touch the wire, you know, the sound, the the buzzer sounds and you, uh, and you lose the game. So here we can move the bead through these, um, through these uh, tubes um, and uh, you can still keep in control, still move the bead. Um, there's just a couple of other examples. So um, um, here we were looking at moving the bead above other kinds of static surfaces. So here, this might be some kind of uh, uh, map showing the heights of mountains or contours or something like that. Um, so we can do the levitation through this material. Now this might be you plotting your route, climbing a mountain or, or something like that. So we can do the um, levitation. We can also of course do haptics through here as well because it's the, it's the same sound. Same sound. Uh, so you can, you can feel um, haptic forces or the beads. Uh, I think actually this one shows the haptics as well. So you, again, you can see the pieces of paper moving when we project haptic forces through those, through those objects. So the interesting thing here is that um, you, can then, uh, you can then create displays, uh, physical displays of, with physical materials, and then project haptics or do levitation uh, above and around them. So some applications, yeah, we've been thinking about dynamic 3D physical displays. So, uh, Maybe you're, you're, a, you're a 3D model designer, so you can create an object um, in front of you in 3D with these physical pixels. You can change it and interact with it, change its shape if you want to, and then it can go away again if you don't want it. Now you might do this now with um, you know, a 3D modeling package or even with a VR headset. But with a VR headset, you're having to trick your eyes into seeing the 3D. It's not real 3D, but with uh, enough pixels, we can create a real 3D object in front of you. You know, it then may look really like your coffee cob, uh, in which case you, you can interact with it. You can share that with other people because it's just sitting in front of you. So it's, it's easy to share. Um, we've looked at presenting data. So you can present dynamic data 
You can have that object, that model change in shape over time. Um, so it gives you new ways to understand your data and your information. And it's very easy to share. It's using all your natural human capabilities. Now I can interact with it using my sense of touch. I can look at it. It's not a trick in any way to make my eyes think it's 3D. You know, it's really 3D. And also, it's very fast. It might be that um, you, know, you might um, print a 3D object or something like that. Um, to see if you've if if you've designed it correctly, but that takes some time and costs some money. Um, but it might be that in our case, you just uh, generate a three D model in physical pixels and say, no, oh, that's not quite right. I need to change this bit here, stretch this bit here. Then you get it right, and then you can send it away for three D printing if you're if you're happy with it. So the whole process becomes much more interactive and much faster. So talking about interaction, um, a big thing that we've focused on is uh, how do we interact with these levitating pixels? It's one thing to levitate them, and actually the levitation is not so difficult. Static levitation is not so difficult. But when you uh, need to interact with them, move them around and control them, then things start to become a little bit more difficult. So one issue is that um, you, you, you can't touch those physical pixels in the, in the array there. If you, if you touch them, they're just polystyrene, they're only held up by air, so it's very easy to knock them out. So what we try and do is interact just in front of them, um, as you saw in the previous picture, uh, the, 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 the gesture sensor is just in front of the array. So you can interact in front of the array, and then your interactions are reflected in the array. So the first thing we did was looking at selection. Selection, pretty fundamental. You've got to be able to choose an object in the display for, for any interaction to take place. But the interesting thing about these kind of arrays is that there's only the objects there. There's nothing else. What, how do you indicate which object that you've selected? So what we've done is we've um, uh, changed the object itself and make it shake around to indicate that it's selected. Now, potentially, you could, of course, project on them or something like that. But in the simplest case, anyway, all you've got is a pixel. So you've got to do something with the pixels. So I'll show a little video of, uh, of um, uh, how it works. So you can see we're pointing at an object, and we make it vibrate slightly. And that's the way that we can indicate that um, which, which one you've chosen in this, in this uh, array of multiple pixels. So we just project a, a ray from your finger towards the objects and then you can choose which one and the one you hit um, starts vibrating. Pretty straightforward, works really well. Um, so uh, uh, one issue of course is the ability of humans to point very precisely. So our beads are about two millimeters up to four millimeters in size and actually it's pretty hard to point at something two millimeters in size uh, within, within an array of, of, of pixels. So actually what we did was we looked at putting a kind of zone around each pixel um, in order to make it um, bigger, make it easier to point at. So you can see from uh, the graph here that um, with a very small tar target, we started off with, with a five millimeter zone. So um, uh, plus or minus two millimeters. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty hard. It takes you a long time. That was taking seven seconds to choose an item, which is pretty slow. And of course, as you make the, the size of the target bigger, not surprisingly, it gets much easier to select it. But of course, as each as the, the, the zone around each target gets bigger, that makes the display less dense or lowers your resolution because you can't have the pixels so close together. So you can see from the graph the kind of trade-off that you get there by increasing the size. So generally, we've been sticking at maybe 15 to 20, 20 millimeters plus or minus 20 millimeters around the center uh, to um, uh, give a reasonable interaction speed, but not make the display uh, too uh, low resolution. Now, the next problem that occurs, of course, is this is a 3D display. So how do you select items that are not the front one? So in a simple experiment, we just turn the array uh, 90 degrees from what we had it in the one I showed you before. Um, and now we started to think about occlusion. So how do I detect the one that's not the front one? Uh, so we came up with a technique called lock ray. 
So what you do here, um, you, you point at a, a set of objects and that ray comes out of your finger and you select the set of objects which are on that, on that line. Then you put out your thumb and as you move your finger backwards and forwards, then you're kind of moving a cursor along that array of objects. And the one that you stop at, that then starts shaking around. You'll see it better in the video. So you see them both shaking. I've selected all the items on that row. And then stick out your thumb. backwards and forwards to select the individual items on that row. So now that would allow you to select any number of items stacked up in depth. So we did a user study to look at that um, uh, and set the target to be about um, 20 millimeters plus or minus 10, so 20 millimeters in size um, to make it a little bit easier for them to point at. So selection time, about 2.5 seconds for, for those items in the array and about 95% accuracy. So people were pretty good at making those kind of selections. Of course, the selection time would increase depending on how many items you had in that, uh, in, in that dimension, um, but it works pretty well. So you can select these um, uh, obstacles further back. Now, another interesting problem that comes, that comes up um, with um, such physical displays as this is obstacle avoidance. So with virtual pixels, this is not a problem. I can move pixels around and they can overlap each other. And there's no problem because they're not physical things. But of course, if I have two pixels, uh, they're gonna bump into each other if I, if I move one into each other. So I need to think about how to deal with this issue. If I want to move this pixel past this pixel, I've got to do something to, to, to get it out of the way. And this is particularly important for dragging uh, if you want to drag objects around in your display. And then, you know, this occurs in any display with physical things in it. So this would be the same if, you're, if you had an array of drones flying in the air and you want to move the drones around. Um, it's, it's a kind of fundamental problem for, for any interaction technique uh, or any, any, any display where you have physical things. So there's lots of different things you can do. Um, so you can, you can um, shift things out of the way, you can divert them, you can repel them, swap them. Um, I'll show you some examples of these in a video in a minute. And you can either move the particle that the user's controlling, or you can move the obstacle. Um, so we conducted a, a, a big study to try and find out what the, the best way of doing this was. Um, yeah, as a spoiler, actually the, the, the divert obstacle one was the best, but let me show you a video of some of this so you can see um, what's going on. Levitating particle displays show content composed of several physical particles levitating in air. It's necessary to enforce constraints between physical particles to avoid them colliding. If two particles get too close together, for example, they might get stuck in the same trap, becoming inseparable. We developed 10 interaction techniques for avoiding collisions during particle movement. These manipulate the position of the obstacle or the controlled particle to keep them apart. Shift obstacle instantly translates the obstacle particle so the user particle can continue along its trajectory. Shift user instantly translates the user particle so that it avoids the obstacle. Shift both combines these techniques. To show you all of those, um, but I, uh, that was that was in a simulation. Um, what I'll show you is just a couple of them um, actually uh, in practice in our in our array. It all looks easy in the video, but actually when you try to do this, you know, in a real sound field with real particles, it's actually quite difficult. So here's here's a, a the the repel obstacle. Uh, repel obstacle uses a repulsive force from the user controlled particle, forcing the obstacle out of the way. You can see it moving in the back. Repel user uses a repulsive force from the obstacle particle, forcing the user particle to travel around it. 
repel both conveyances. Divert obstacle incrementally offsets the obstacle particle so the user particle can continue along its trajectory. Divert user moves the user particle on a curved path around the obstacle. Divert both conveyances. You get the idea. Hopefully you could uh, you can hear Ewan's nice uh, Scottish accent as well. Um, so I think that, that brings up some you know some really interesting problems that you know you just don't get you don't get those kind of issues in in um, uh, uh, virtual pixel displays the kind of things that we're used to on desktops um, and uh, computer screens. Now, there's these physical constraints you suddenly have to start thinking about. They don't happen when you your pixels you know, the pixels don't really exist they're just virtual things but when the pixels are physically there you have to do something about it. Um, now, uh, uh, of course, one problem comes when you're trying to move these things is that, of course, if I move one pixel out the way, so I'm dragging along, I move this pixel out the way, well, what happens if there's another pixel here? Then this one has to move. And maybe then you, you may get these kind of cascading effects of, um, of moving the pixels. Uh, so uh, that's something that we're looking at at the moment, because um, eventually, you know, you'd end up pushing things out the side of the array because you had to move so many things. So, so the scaling is really an issue here. What we want to do is create arrays of, of you know, thousands or millions of pixels eventually so we can create really high resolution objects. And that's, that's fine if the objects don't need to move or be, be manipulated. But as soon as you want to start controlling and manipulating them, then you have to deal with these physical constraints. So what do you do with those pixels when you move them if there are others in the way? So we have got plans for that, and we've done some, some pilot testing of different things around those of, of trying to reduce the amount you need to move each time, especially if you have um, this zone around, of e around each pixel, um, which uh, I mentioned before, enables you to point at it more accurately. Well, that gives you some free space that you can use um, to push the pixels closer together because you're not interacting with those, you're only interacting with the one in the front. So there are things you can do. Uh, but, you know, there's really interesting scaling problems here that, that um, are different to the kind of scaling problems that you have by just buying a bigger monitor uh, or something like that to put on your PC. Right, let's think about a, a, a few conclusions from all these things that I've talked about. Um, so we started off um, talking about this idea of multimodal human computer interaction. So here we're looking at, uh, can we create richer interactions between the user and the technology? Than we have now. Right now, we just use a bit of our eyes and a bit of our fingers, and that's about it most of the time. How can we use all those things that humans are capable of? Humans have got a great sense of hearing. How can we use that? Humans have got a great sense of touch, more than just hitting a screen. We can do all sorts of things with our sense of touch. It's really rich. How do we use that? How do we use our other senses? I've talked about um, only haptics, really, but we've done lots of work on things like smell. We've done things work with things like hearing. So there's all sorts of work going on in these other senses. So we started off talking about ultrasound uh, um, for uh, non-contact haptics. So ultrasound is, you know, it's, it's a highly novel modality. Very little work really going on yet about, about uh, how it can be used. Um, but the underlying technology is pretty straightforward. We're just using the same loudspeakers that are, are now in, in you know, millions or maybe um, hundreds of millions of cars. To stop them reversing into things. So the hardware is nothing very, very difficult. So the hardware is available. It's just using it in an interesting way. So you can combine the sound, the, the sounds from those loudspeakers. Uh, so then to create haptic forces. So I can then make non-contact haptics. I can beam those, those haptic forces against my hand. And that means I can do haptics wherever. I could have I could have a ring of them around my webcam. Uh, I can be doing gestures in front of my webcam. I can be feeling haptic forces from interacting. I can have them coming from my phone. I can have them coming from controls, virtual controls, by the side of my PC if I want them. Like I said before, we've, we've also used them in cars. The idea being if I'm holding the wheel, I can reach out and I can have the control put, put to where my hand is rather than me having to reach far to do, the, to do the controls. I can have it come to my hand. So, you know, it can provide rich interaction, maybe improve safety, 
and I can have the controls appear and disappear when I need them. I don't have to have them there all the time. And then I can have whatever control I want. If I want a slider, I have a slider. If I want a button, I have a button. Um, I can have whatever I need at the time I need it. So it's very flexible and rich and allows you to use that sense of touch. Um, then the next stage is levitation. So there's something really interesting here, I think, about a totally new form of display. So here we're, we're levitating, controlling these, these very small physical pixels and controlling them and doing, doing interesting movement and positioning of them. So uh, you can create physical displays. Now at the moment, you know, we can, dis we can di create displays with tens or twenties of pixels. In. There's no reason why you can't scale that up to thousands. It's easy to do that right now if you don't want movement, you wanted a static object. Um, but as soon as you want movement and interaction, then it becomes more difficult. So I like to think about this is, you know, if you think back to the 1960s, um, uh, pixels were invented. And uh, uh, in a lab somewhere, somebody said, wow, I've created a pixel on the screen. I can, I can make one pixel appear on this screen. Don't know what it's going to be for yet, but it's important. Uh, and then, you know, 30, 40 years later, 50 years later, now we've got so many pixels, we don't, you know, we don't even count them. So we're at that kind of stage with, with the, uh, these physical displays. So we can control the pixels uh, in small numbers. We can make them do what we want. We can position them, um, uh, but we haven't yet scaled them up to be uh, uh, thousands or millions. But that's a really a kind of step on from where we are now. That's what happened from the, the 60s, 70s, 80s onwards until LCD screens or whatever became completely standard things. And we're in that kind of starting point, in the birth of these physical pixels. So what we did in our project really, I think, was build the foundations for interaction. So we can create the haptic effects, we can create the levitation effects, we can move the beads around, we can put them where we want them, we can move them quickly, we can position them carefully. And now it's kind of like, we can hand this over to the, to the rest of the world and say, okay, right, well, look, we've given you the tools, now go away and create some really, some really crazy applications with them. What, what things can you do with these uh, that, will, that will kind of blow people's minds? just in the same way that now you can do amazing things with graphical displays. Um, so we've kind of given those uh, initial tools. So now it's kind of open to, to you guys and everybody else to say, right, okay, I've got a great idea. I want to make, I want to make something in 3D with these, with these pixels. Uh, so we've kind of given you uh, the tools to enable you to do that. So with that, uh, I will finish. Um, hopefully that's been interesting and I've taught you, told you something about ultrasound and what it can do for haptics and for levitation. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank, thank you. Uh, Steve. Uh, we have uh, enough time for a couple of questions. Do you have some question? I have one if nobody else does. Ugo. <laughs> Um, you first, please, see it. Okay, just about this last part about scaling up, and I'm sorry if I did, I, you did say it and I missed it. Uh, in pixels, I guess the limitation was the number of transistors that we could put in a computer, among other things. But in this case, with what is it? What, what would need to happen you think, for it to be able to just blow up? Yeah, I mean, in the end, it comes down to quite a lot down to the, the number of um, uh, loudspeakers. The more loudspeakers, the more force um, uh, you, that you create. The other thing is, so I, I claimed that having these loudspeakers that were used in cars um, is a good thing, which it is, but it's also a bad thing because those loudspeakers, they're maybe just under one centimeter uh, diameter, um, and they all and they always run at 40 40 ish kilohertz. What we would like to do would have actuators that are smaller, so we can make a denser array. So packing more transistors in, or you know having having more pixels, having more loudspeakers, and also increasing the frequency would allow us to create even more precise control. But nobody really manufactures those yet. You don't need those for cars. So the car, the car guys aren't interested in those. So at the moment, there's, there's no commercial use for those small high frequency transducers. Um, either 
we've got to persuade a company that they should make them or some other some other use case comes along and comes in, oh we really need high frequency uh, small transducers um, so it's not a dissimilar limitation to the transistor problem but it's you know it's a it's a, a loudspeaker problem really. thanks Uber? Uh, this is a nice talk, uh, Steve. Um, I like it a lot. Um, um, this is a new paradigm uh, to uh, for human computer interface. I think so. Uh, this um, array of of speakers can bring up a new way to um, capture the human perception. Um, uh, how do you think about uh, what do you think about uh, ne neuro neurological disorders uh, applications? Uh, because I think this technology uh, uses the force of the speakers to um, to interact, but interaction can um, uh, can uh, can express many uh, many ways to. To, to interact with different kinds of persons. Um, but how do you think about neuro neurological trans uh, disorders? Yeah, that's a great, great idea. Um, so that's not something that we've done much work on, but, but actually I think it's, um, uh, it's an interesting area. So for example, if you, if you had problems grasping, uh, so yes. maybe holding a control might be difficult or movement, so getting your hand into a particular place to hold a control. Well, we could, we could display that control to your hand wherever it is. So you wouldn't need to reach very far uh, or grasp anything. We can just display, we can display the haptics to your hand um, uh, wherever your hand is in the space. So I think it could be, could be quite interesting uh, in, that, in, that, in, your, in your scenario there. That's not one we've done any work on, but I think it's a really good one. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the energy consumption? Because this is a right of speakers. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's it's not it's not huge. Um, so <coughs> each, of, <coughs> each of those speakers is um, you know, it's a small loudspeaker. Uh, they're designed to be used in cars, so they they're, they're, they're not really high power consumption. Of course, you need a lot of them. So you know, our newer arrays have um, 1,024, you know, 512 and 512. Although for the haptic yeah. side, you only need, for haptics, you only need a single side. Um, so the power consumption is not, is not um, um, terrible. More power is used when you start to move things around. But if things are, if things are um, static in the array, then um, the power consumption is, is not so high. Okay. Thank you. This, this, this probably would be a, interesting solution or uh, human interaction, new human interaction interface for social robots. Uh, probably we will contact you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, I think so. We, we, we haven't done anything in that area, but we, again, we have some social robots guys in our group. And I think, um, you know, the, as a way for the robot to communicate with you, um, yes. Is, is a nice way you can feel you can feel something about the robot even before you've touched it you can feel its state but one thing that um one of the other guys on the project was looking at was a kind of um covid safe uh interaction because yes i can Robots. beam an interaction to my hand i know i don't have to touch touch anything anymore interaction could come to my hand so then i don't have to be contaminated by touching something or or me touch something else and give something to another person so again with the with the robot with the social robot i wouldn't necessarily need to touch it i could i could um, communicate with it through touch but not physically touching in case there was any contamination so it's, nice. yeah, i think it's interesting in that in that area thank you thanks a lot i think diego have another question yes thanks Carlos. Yes, uh, hello, Steve. Uh, thank Hi. you very much for the talk. It was uh, very interesting and exciting. Uh, and my question is, uh, yes, I was thinking about uh, scalability, as you mentioned. 
And what about the initialization in scalability? Is like you have to place the pixels one by one, or you can just throw a lot of pixels there, and they will settle somehow. And a second question will be: uh, How long, uh, how much time do you think this uh, technology will require to reach, like real applications, like maybe in the industry or something? Yeah. Okay. Um, so first one is kind of initialization. So Initialization is, is definitely an interesting problem. You've, you've, you've found a kind of weakness in some way there. So right now, much of our initialization is this. Yeah. <laughs> Next one. Uh, put it in. I, I don't want to do that a million times. That's not much fun. Um, so uh, you, can do, you can do it. So what, one of the partners on the project, we had a, a basically... Um, a tray of pixels uh, of those polystyrene styrofoam pixels and then use use the ultrasound to pick them out and maneuver them into place so you can do that uh, but even doing that is pretty slow and um, doing that for a million is still pretty slow um, so th there are things you could you could imagine just getting a, a whole a whole handful and just throwing them into the array and then and then catching them in the in the um, zones where you want the um, where you want them to be so I think there's yeah, definitely maybe some sort of vibration or, or oscillation for them to take place. It sounds like interesting, no? Yeah. So I think you know that's one of the tools that we haven't got a good solution for yet. We've got some simple solutions, but that the solution we have doesn't scale up to a million. Um, so um, that that's definitely something that that needs to be um, to be worked on a bit more. At the moment, the solutions are a bit kind of uh, handmade. You, know, you can't put you can't place them in one by one for a large array that works well for experiments and, and small trials but not for real life um in answer to your second question so as part of the project we have a company called um, ultra leap so they they right now make ultrasound haptics boards that you can buy um so there are not too many applications yet there there were companies spun off from um, a university in the uk as part of a previous project we had um, but that you can buy one of those boards right now. So, so the ultrasound haptics part, that's standard commercial thing. You could, you could um, uh, buy that right now if you wanted to. Um, they are also thinking about commercializing the um, levitation part um, um, as part of the project that we're now doing, um, but they, that's still in process. So I think that's still a little bit further away. And um, you know, I, don't, I don't know how long it took it's an interesting question. How long did it take from the guy who, who first made a pixel in the engineering lab and say, look, I've made a pixel on, the, on my screen till you could buy a screen with pixels? I don't know how long that time period was. Um, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years. It's kind of hard to say. But I, I, you know, I imagine it's something similar. That we can do it now and it works in specialized cases. But to buy an off-the-shelf device, well, ah, but again, you see, the devices are off the shelf. You can buy the, the hardware that we use, those two arrays, you can buy them right now. It's the same array that you use for the haptics. So you can go and buy them right now. It's just, a, it's just the software and the control and the management of the pixels. Um, so in some ways, it's kind of a software, a software-ish problem rather than a hardware problem. So, you know, 10 years, 10 years maybe, something like that. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for your exciting and interesting uh, uh, talk. Uh, we expect that some of these days you can come to Zacatecas, Mexico, and maybe uh, collaborate with our team. Uh, your, inter your, your research line is really, really interesting. I know that many other of, uh, of the participants here have uh, some questions. Can you please uh, give us uh, the, the opportunity to, to interact with you, maybe with a, an email or something like that? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, um, please please feel free to send me a, uh, send me an email, um, or we can you know we can have a another Zoom chat in a smaller group if if that is more uh, uh, preferable. So yeah, very happy to chat. If there's any research collaborations we can think of doing. You know, between social robots or anything like that, then you know we're we're definitely um, definitely interested. And yes, I would absolutely love to, to come and visit sometime. 
uh, uh, of course, and also you'd be we're very welcome to uh, to come visit us in Glasgow too. Thank you, Steve. Um, I hope that maybe we are not as well dancing like the Colombians guys, but maybe we can dance another kind of music and you can enjoy it uh, also as well. Um, thank you so much, uh, Steve. Uh, uh, thank you for your, your help. And um, uh, I, I hope that some of these days we, we can uh, uh, do some research together. Thank you. Fantastic. Great. Thank you uh, all. Nice to nice to virtually talk to you all. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me. Um, I have some. I, I I am going to let give a couple of bats. Uh, let me switch to Spanish. Uh, La, la, la siguiente charla que nosotros tenemos es el día eh, op, es el día viernes 4 de junio donde nuestros colegas Héctor Becerra y el doctor Rafael Murrieta de CIMAT van a, van a platicarnos sobre eh, la investigación que hacemos acá en México, en Zacatecas, sobre eh, robótica e interacción humano-robot. Entonces, están cordialmente invitados. Eh, y bueno, este, agradecerles su asistencia, recordarles que nosotros tenemos, hemos abierto esta, esta maestría en robótica de, desde reciente creación. Eh, y bueno, tenemos, actualmente tenemos la, la convocatoria abierta donde ustedes pueden participar. Eh, esos son el par de mensajes. Les agradezco mucho su asistencia.